I'll let these people in. All right, everybody, welcome to our Q&A with Mr. Brian Burke, who's going to enlighten us about all kinds of stuff about multifamily. Uh, this is also being live streamed in the Facebook group. But if you're watching this on Facebook, please use the link to come into the Zoom call if you want to ask questions, because I can't really follow what's going on on Facebook because there's a little bit of a lag there. But uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to like interview Brian a little bit, get his backstory out. Uh, talk to him about stuff like, you know, why he sold all his property and how he knew to do that. And uh, and then I'm going to open it up to you guys for any questions. So uh, once again, if you got got questions up, you can pop them into the chat if you want. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll just do that. So Brian, welcome. Thanks for taking some time to hang out with us today and talk multifamily real estate investing. Uh, it's always good to see you. Um, so... Just, uh, you know, real briefly for people who, who don't know you, just can you give a little background as to, you know, who you are, how you got started in this, this business, and then how you got to be Brian Burke? <laughs> well, I don't know. What does that mean, Jonathan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so just, uh, yeah, just just give the folks a little bit of your background and how you got into the the business and stuff. Yeah, like yeah. I, st I started uh, investing in real estate 33, 34 years ago. Uh, I was not that far out of high school. And I didn't know anything about real estate and I didn't have any money and uh, I didn't have any connections or contacts. So I figured, you know, I had everything I needed to be a successful real estate investor. So, mm. <laughs> so I gave it a, I gave it a shot. I started out flipping houses. I grew a house flipping business to one where I was doing uh, a pretty decent amount of volume. Uh, when the economy collapsed in 08, uh, I was doing a massive amount of volume. I was buying foreclosed houses on the courthouse steps, fixing them up and reselling them. I was doing about a little over 100 of those a year and uh, built up a nice rental portfolio and uh, and kind of on the at the same time was building a multifamily business and uh, buying apartment complexes and fixing them up and either holding them or reselling them. Uh, so now here we are, 2023. I've done about 800 million in real estate acquisitions. Uh, bought uh, over 4,000 multifamily units, and uh, I think I'm up to like 770 single-family houses, or somewhere right around in there. I didn't realize you're still doing single-family houses. I, yeah, all these still... times I've talked to you, I have, I have like, I talk. So I talk with Brian almost every month and I've interviewed him. Like I've lost count of how many times I've interviewed you for podcasts and things like that. Somehow this detail has eluded me that you actually still have all those houses. And there's like more have, houses than like anybody else I've ever heard of before. Don't have them all. I've uh, yeah. bought them and sold them all. Uh, okay. But I still do a few. And in fact, we bought four houses uh, so far this year. So, you know, you just, you just never know. I mean, I, I uh, I like investing in real estate. And you said that uh, you're glad to have me here to talk about real estate. It's like, well, I don't have anything else to talk about. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that works. So, God. wait, so, uh, yeah, I mean, listen, so tell me about the houses. Like, like this is, so you're still, when you're buying houses now, like, what are you buying? You're still buying uh, fix and flips or like, whoa. Are yeah, buying still buying, like yeah, still buying houses at the courthouse steps. I've got, I've got a small team. Uh, that's that's been with me since before the last crash. Uh, they uh, they helped me build my uh, uh, business up to where we got to doing over a hundred houses a year. And when the economy started to get better, and there was fewer of those opportunities, I didn't let that staff go. I kept them, and uh, all along they've been chugging along, even you know just still doing a few a year, and that's good enough for me. Wow! And so what? you know, have things changed in terms of what it is that you guys look for now? Or you do like bigger houses, luxury houses, or it's still the same, the same sort of, you know, formula still that you had 30 years ago. Same old, same old, you know, last year, we, I think we bought a house last year for like 120 grand and we've bought houses for like 450, uh, you know, and this is California stuff. So it kind of, runs the gamut of everything, but no, I don't do the luxury house stuff. I've been there and done that. And for some reason, every time I do it, I lose money. So I don't like the high end stuff anymore. Just that kind of right down the middle of the fairway stuff seems to work best for me. Right. 
So um, at the at the last recessions now i mean you you've now gone through a couple of these obviously right so at the at the at the, the in the great financial crisis so you said before you're buying you know stuff on this courthouse steps and 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 making a killing but what were you doing before the crash like what were you i and presumably you were doing houses and stuff before the crash but kind of tell me about that period of your investment career before the, the great crash like what were you doing what were you seeing what were you thinking as that was all going on. So pre-crash, call it like, we'll pick the period of 2000 through 2007 is kind of what I would call pre-crash. I started out the earlier part of that period, like 2000 through 03 or 04, I was actually building houses. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I just was buying, I was buying foreclosed lots at the courthouse steps in a community where the homeowners association was foreclosing on the dues. So I was picking up lots for like six grand, building wow. houses on them and selling the houses for like 350. And I I was doing that for a few years and then the market started to go up and uh, I realized that I still had a half dozen lots left in my inventory and I'm like, man, I bought these lots for like six grand and I could sell them for 80 grand. I might as well just sell the lots. I'll make the same amount of money on the lots as I would on the house. So I shifted my strategy and, uh, and started selling the lots. And, and it turned out to be a really good decision because had I built them, the time it would have taken me to get all the way through the process, I might've ended up with those houses right when the market shut off like a light switch in August of 2005. So uh, then I kind of turned my focus towards more commercial stuff. I bought a lakefront resort and fixed it up. And then I bought uh, some land and built a self-storage facility. Uh, both of those things turned out to be kind of nightmarish for me. Uh, but uh, I stopped buying houses because what I was watching was I was watching prices climbing through the roof. I was watching rents not climbing through the roof. Mm. And it didn't make any sense to me to, you know, be buying $550,000 houses that would rent for $1,500 a month. I just felt like the economics were dislocated and something was going to happen. There was, uh, I was watching the financing that was going on in the uh, home buyer market, recognizing that there was a lot of risk being taken by lenders. And I just felt like something bad was going to happen. There was going to be a lot of houses for sale and no one was going to want them. And I didn't want to be somebody that was holding on to them. So I just kind of stopped doing a lot of that stuff altogether. I, I focused on my little commercial stuff for a little while and kind of ignored the housing market for a few years. And then uh, the bottom fell out. Uh, and I guess I could say it, it wasn't entirely unpredictable. I mean, it's kind of what I was saying all along for those last, you know, from 04, 05, that it was just something was wrong. Yeah, like, so I, I'm curious as to what, what tipped you off. Like when everybody else in that period, I mean, I'm sure there were a few other people who were kind of thinking the same way you were, but the generally speaking, the market was going like bonkers, right? I mean, it everybody's was. buying houses. Every time, every I just remember back in those days, and I was still a lawyer then. Like every TV show was about flipping houses, right? It was just insane the amount of attention that house flipping was getting, uh, and all kinds of real estate shows. What? Why was it that you were like your spidey sense went up, and you decided to kind of buck the trend? Like I know, I mean, I know you said it got uncomfortable, but it, I mean, everybody else was seeing the same stuff, seeing the same data. Why do you think that you were spooked by it or, or, you know, what were you just, I think I'm really curious, like what, what you went through. I was paying less attention to data and more attention to just gut feel of what was happening. So mm -hmm. I, I went to this real estate conference. I think it was in 05. Uh, it was held in San Francisco at the Moscone center. And which is a huge uh, event space. If anybody hasn't been there and seen what this, this it's gigantic. Donald Trump was a speaker, Robert Kiyosaki. I mean, like everybody was there. And th there was there had to have been 40 to 50,000 people at this event. I wow. mean, the hallways were so crowded, you couldn't even walk in there. And I just, you know, when, then I would go to like real estate meetups and people would be like, I got to gotta, I gotta buy a rental house. I'm like, why? They're 550 grand. They rent for 1500 a month. What's so appealing? 
and like, well, you know, this guy I know, he's a plumber and he bought this house and then sold it like a year later and he made 150 grand because the price went up so much. And, and you know, whenever I hear those stories, like when, when it's one of those situations where like everybody's doing it, like 50,000 people at the Moscone Center, uh, every walk of life, everybody is buying real estate. That to me is just a, a signal that it's time to get out. And, and so that's what I did. I just, I just, I had enough. I, had you had any experience with, with that kind of thing before then, or was this, was this the first time you'd seen that sort of thing? No, I, I, I hadn't, you know, I, I hadn't seen it to this level. No. And so when you kind of cast yourself forward to the last couple of years, you know, I, I want to talk about how you built it, but I, I want to jump into what you were again, sort of seeing and and feeling because you know you did sell a substantial amount of your portfolio really at the right time um but what was it that was going through your mind then when you when you did that and and you know how how what were the parallels to what you'd experienced back in 05 so you're talking about my recent sales like a year ago yeah 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 so it was the same thing so we had you know i don't know 3 or 4000 uh, apartment units. And when I would put in an offer on uh, a, an acquisition that we were, you know, we were looking at buying more apartments and I'd put in an offer and we wouldn't get it. And I would talk to the broker about, well, you know, how did it look for us? You know, how close did we come? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You know, you're not even in the top 10, you know, there, we had 27 offers uh, the top 10 all had million dollar non-refundable deposits day one, you know, no inspections, this, that, and the other thing, blah, blah, blah. And, and it just brought me right back to that time, you know, in 2005, where it's like, this is, this is ridiculous. This is the craziest thing, you know, how am I, A, how am I supposed to buy anything? Hmm. And B, what does this mean for where the market is going? And that's when, uh, we decided let's let's put a property on the market and see what happens. So we had this one asset we we put on the market, and you know we did the full marketing, where uh, you know it's on thirty day exposure, and and then we would you know go collect offers and then pick the top offers and you know and then go to a second round and the whole the whole thing. And I think we had uh, at least seventeen offers on this property and you know, 12 of them were good offers from solid buyers. And some of them were good offers from, you know, like buyers you'd never heard of. And you're like, who's this guy? You know, it's like, mm -hmm. okay, here we are back to like, everybody's doing it again. Right. You know, I'd go on bigger pockets and it's like, everybody's a syndicator, literally everybody. And it just brought me right back to 05. And I thought, you know what? There's when I've always been a little bit of a contrarian, whatever anybody's doing is what I don't want to be doing. And whatever everybody's telling me is the dumbest thing to do is kind of what I want to be doing. And, and so we started selling and we listed a bunch of, uh, a bunch of our properties. And, you know, this was also a time when I was getting pinged by brokers on the daily, you know, mm -hmm. oh, I got a buyer for thus and such, you know, would you entertain an offer? It's like, yeah, sure. Send me one. And, and usually, you know, you're not going to get, one. it's just all talk. Uh, but we actually, the market was so hot. People actually were sending in offers and we started transacting some deals off market and we were getting prices that were better than what we likely would have gotten had we gone full market mm -hmm. because it was the stigma of the off market deal. And um, lo and behold, 2021, and the first half of 2022, we'd sold three quarters of our portfolio. Uh, the only things that we had left uh, were five fairly recently acquired class A properties in great markets, all of which I wanted to keep. And uh, now here we are just waiting for the right time to get back in and haven't seen that time yet. So what was it about the five properties that uh, made you want to help hold them? Like what was unique to those? Top markets is is one, and the other is high quality. You know, I've I've got a flight to quality mentality, mm. where you know when the economy gets shaky, when the market gets shaky, I want to own high quality assets in good places. I don't want to own shaky stuff. Uh, it's just it's a disaster. And I mean that that goes contrary to a lot of like the received wisdom that you hear all the time, like. 
that people say, oh, the cheaper the apartment, the better it is in a recession. And I'm sure you've heard that, you know, bandied around, uh, you know. Uh, it's BS. Yeah. It's total BS. Uh, you know, this, so this is this is the argument. The argument goes like this. Uh, I buy class C in a weak economy because in a week, you know, when times are tough, uh, the people in B's will need to save money and they'll move to C's and the people in A's will need to save money and they'll move to B's. And so A's are going to do the worst and C's are going to do the best. And I've been doing this for 33 years now, and that has not been my experience. That's a great theory. It sounds good, but I haven't found it to be true. And you know what I have found is that in tough times, the C's stop paying their rent and they wait for the sheriff to show up. And now you have, you know, half your units are empty and the other half aren't paying. Uh, that's the C's. Uh, the B's don't move the C's because there's chaos. Uh, so the B's stay put or they double up and they'll move in with their friend who's in a B and they'll split the rent half and half. And half. Uh, the A's tend to do just fine because those people have generally enough economic resiliency to be able to stick stick it out. Uh, so I've, I've found the opposite theory to be true in my personal experience. Now, everybody's mileage may vary. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, when I was going through something similar in 2019, and, you know, like I, I sold my whole, not, not the size of yours, but I sold my portfolio such as it was in 2019. And the thing that was going into my thinking at the time was these are all C properties. The economy is supposedly really good right now. And we're having collections problems. I don't really want to see what the collections problems are like when the economy goes bad. And there was a lot of people saying the economy, we're about to tip into recession in 2019. So when I started getting offers that were like way more than I thought my property was worth, I was like, here, take them, you know? And then my big fear was that we weren't going to close and, you know, and they were going to figure out what a dumb thing they were doing by buying these properties from me. Uh, but, and I remember at the time asking my property manager who has been in the business for 30 years, like, cause I wanted a reality check. Like, hey, and I was like, Hey, Mike, in a recession, to see properties do better. And he sort of laughed at me. He was like, no, they don't. Where'd you get that idea from? So <laughs> I heard uh, it in a seminar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, people keep on telling me this in my Facebook group and I don't, doesn't make sense to me, but I, I just want a reality check. And he's like, no, your gut is right. Uh, so yeah. So uh, then on the flip side of this, so listen, I mean, we, you know, we're hearing a lot these days about uh, oh, there's so much construction in Class A. Uh, you know, we're going to have softness in the Class A rental market. Uh, you know, what's the reaction, and what are you what are you seeing in reality? Well, that's such a localized um, opinion. Uh, you know, that it may be very true that in certain areas where there's a lot of development, that you can see some weakness in class A because, you know, nobody's creating any class C competition, right? You know, what's there is there. Uh, but there's, they're certainly creating class A competition. Uh, but I'll say this, I, uh, I had a property in uh, Conroe, Texas, that was a class C property. And this was several years ago. And down the street, somebody built a class A. And you think, well, so what? You know, you're not competing for the same tenant. But guess what the Class A property does to meet their lending covenants? Their lender tells them you have to have X percent lease up on a monthly basis, blah, 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 blah. So what they do is they say, okay, we're going to offer three months free rent uh, for new move-ins. And so the people in the Class C are like, what? <laughs> You know, yeah, it's two hundred and fifty dollars more a month to rent those units, but I get three months free. So over the next twelve months, I'll spend the exact same amount of money renting that Class A uh, unit as I am renting this Class C unit. What am I doing here? And it, our property lost twenty percent occupancy when wow. they started when they launched that uh, new development. So uh, one cannot convince me that Class A does not compete with Class C because it in fact mm -hmm. does. Uh, but everything is highly local. So, you know, we own uh, two class A apartment complexes in a suburb of Atlanta, Georgia. The particular county that we're located in has a building moratorium on multifamily housing. 
no one's built any. Ours were built in like 2000, 2001. Nobody's built mm -hmm. anything hardly since and isn't likely to for quite some time. So I'm not going to feel the effect in those properties from class A construction at all because there just really isn't any in the immediate area. But if you were, if you owned in Tempe, Arizona, for example, and there was like a ton of properties going in literally blocks away, I think you could see uh, some occupancy challenges. Now, what does that do to rent? Probably nothing to asking rents. Where it damages you is in effective rents and occupancy. Mm -hmm. So uh, occupancy, meaning that, you know, you're going to drop a few points because there's competition and effective rents, meaning you're going to offer concessions. You might keep your rents the same, but you're going to see now you got to offer two weeks free or a month free or, you know, to compete with this new property. And ultimately that that ends up costing you money. Right. Although, the, the, you know, that's they do burn off, though, which is why people would rather offer their concessions. That that's right. Cut, because cut it, rent. Yeah. optically, it looks like the rent is the same, but really oh. the rent is a lot less. And then what happens when the concession burns off? Uh, you know, if the person stays great, if they move out, now you're back to giving the next guy two weeks free and you got turnover costs. So, uh, you know, there's a, it goes, the knife cuts both ways. Right. So what are you waiting for to get back in? What's, what kind of signals are you looking for? Or, or, or what will, you know, what's going to tell you, okay, it's time to start buying again? There's a couple things. Uh, one is clearer signals. Uh, there are there are three variables that are important in commercial property analysis uh, that I cannot accurately quantify right now. Uh, one of those variables is interest rates. Nobody really knows where they're going. Now, maybe we can all share the opinion that they're going higher, uh, but the sellers seem convinced that they're going lower and everything's fine. Nothing to see here. You know, give me an offer like it was, you know, 2022. No. Uh, you know, that's not going to work. The second variable is rent growth. Uh, you know, historical rent growth is easy to find, but finding future rent growth forecasts uh, is is very difficult right now because nobody really knows what they're talking about. And when there's so many different things happening, uh, it'll impact that future rent growth. And whatever forecast people are making is probably going to be far from accurate by the time it actually plays out. So not knowing where rents are going is the second thing. Uh, the third one is exit cap rates. Uh, without knowing really where exit cap rates are going to shake out in five years, it's very difficult to underwrite an exit. So, so the first thing I'm waiting for is clarity. I, I want to get clarity on some of those um, those underwriting metrics to be able to do better financial analysis. The second thing I'm waiting on is some sort of panic. And you know, there's a, there's an old saying that people always like to quote the Warren Buffett saying that mm -hmm. says, you know, be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. And there's a lot of people that are saying like, uh, okay. Uh, buyers are fearful. So now it's people are fearful. It's time to be greedy. And I disagree uh, because I, I think what I want to see is I want to see sellers fearful. Mm. And right now I am not seeing that. Uh, anybody that owns uh, multifamily right now that has fixed rate debt is like, I'm good. Operationally, we're fine. Uh, anybody who's on floating rate debt, myself included, because I tend to favor floating rate debt myself, uh, is uh, is feeling some pinch uh, from uh, increased rates and from rate cap replacement costs. Uh, and that's compromising cash flow, uh, which is unfortunate, but it's not a threat to survival. Uh, you know, we've, for our portfolio, uh, we're getting hit pretty hard with rate cap replacement reserve allowances but we're still beating all of our operational targets. We've got tons of cash. So, you know, we're going to be totally fine. I'm in no pressure to sell. The people who have bridge loans that are coming due are going to be at some point uh, in a situation. And they're, they're going to have to either refinance or sell uh, or come up with capital. Uh, refinancing is going to be difficult because rates are far higher than where they were when they took their loans out. Their properties are going to coverage constrained to a lower proceeds uh, than where they went in, and they're going to have to bring cash to the table 
to uh, to close that loan. So that's that's going to be challenging for people. And the harder their lenders press, and the worse those two numbers diverge from one another, being the the payoff balance and the new loan balance. The farther those numbers get apart from each other, the more panic there's going to be. The less capitalized the sponsor, the more panic there's going to be. And eventually, those sellers are going to be fearful that they're going to lose their properties to foreclosure, lose their investors' money, have to make a capital call. Uh, whatever the case may be. And that's going to be when there's going to be some opportunity to buy. And so some, some fear will bring some opportunity and some clarity will bring a little bit better ability to underwrite. That's kind of what I'm waiting for. And, and do, you, do you think that there really will be uh, foreclosures or do you think that there will just be like real pressure to sell? I mean, do you, th do you think that the threat of foreclosure is is real? The banks really want to foreclose on, on all this property? I mean, what's your view? Yeah, well, in some cases, they have no choice. Uh, you know, and, and a lot of these bridge lenders aren't written by banks. They're written by private capital debt funds. The debt funds have obligations that they have to satisfy. Uh, you know, they might have warehouse debt, which is meaning uh, the lender makes a loan to the borrower and the lender funds that loan in part by capital that they borrow from an actual bank. Mm -hmm. And that actual bank could be saying to that lender, uh, these loans have been on the line too long. So like, for example, let's say you've got a three-year warehouse line and uh, you put all this three-year bridge debt on it and the bridge debt matures and the lender is like, you know, hey, that's cool. You know, we'll give you two more years. Well, the warehouse lender could be saying like, guys, you know, your, your line is up. Uh, that loan, you can extend it all you want, but that loan has to come off. And that means that the lender has to come up with cash or other collateral to substitute to satisfy their warehouse lender. And so they have to do something. They may be pushed to foreclose and whether they want to or not. So eventually something's going to happen. It just depends on how long this goes on. If this is temporary and in six months, you know, the world's kumbaya, uh, then yeah, probably not. They'll do some workouts and some extensions. But if this keeps going for another two years, these lenders are going to be backed into a corner by their own lenders. And, and what about, you know, I've been hearing a lot about like uh, preferred equity rescue funds and things like that. Like, uh, how are these going to come into play and and what is the impact of those lenders or those investors going to be on like sponsors and LPs and stuff in these deals? Well, preferred e equity rescue uh, in many cases will kick the can down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, it may allow some sponsors to uh prolong the news that they'll have to ultimately deliver their investors that they've lost their investment uh, because they, well, look, we, we we salvaged it. We got refinanced. We got this, you know, we got this uh, rescue equity. We've refied all is well in the world, except that all that new capital they just brought in is in a senior position to the common equity that they originally raised. And so now the property has to go up in value by that much more. So if values run away, uh, then everybody's going to be fine. Uh, if values stagnate for a long period of time, uh, which maybe they will, uh, then they may never outrun the senior equity that was put into place and that common equity could suffer a partial or even complete loss of equity. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. I've already gotten calls from people saying like, you know, hey, I'm invested in this deal and the sponsor is issuing a capital call. And what should I do? Should I send in the money? Or, or some of them, one guy told me that, the, that they, uh, they told me they were going to wipe out all their accrued preferred and then, uh, and then bring in other capital and dilute people. And I mean, there's all kinds of odd stories that are only just beginning to be told. And, and, and I mean, uh, this is just, uh, I'm asking you to speculate, but speculate away. Uh, you know, wh what do you think is going to happen? Or how do you think LPs are going to react to being asked to, you know, to fund capital calls? Do you think that uh, they're going to come up with the, I mean, obviously the answer is, you know, probably some will, some won't, but I mean, as a general proposition, 
you know, what do you, do you have a view as to what, what's going to happen here when capital calls start going out? Well, I've been very fortunate in my, you know, couple, three decades here of never having had to make a capital call. So I can't speak from personal experience how investors will react, but I have gotten calls from people uh, that are telling me that their sponsors are starting to ask for capital calls. And uh, at least the ones that I've talked to aren't happy about it. Uh, that doesn't mean that maybe there's 90% of them out there going, yeah, sure. Where do I send the check? And they're not calling me, obviously. Uh, but I, I suspect that's probably not the case. My guess is that uh, investors are going to panic to a certain extent because they're thinking, am I throwing good money after bad? Uh, have I lost all my equity? There's going to be some extraordinarily uncomfortable conversations between those investors and those sponsors in those cases. And, and no, nobody is going to be uh, feeling very good about it. Now, some of these investors simply don't have the cash. Mm. Uh, you know, how many of these, especially newer syndicators are bringing on investors and taking their only 50 grand? Uh, that's going to be problematic. Uh, if, you know, and so those investors, you know, they could raise new capital from new investors and dilute the old investors. They could certainly do that. Uh, that's probably a better outcome than, than many others, but there's a, there's going to be some pain. And what do you think the effect on the LP market will be if, you know, capital calls start getting issued widely enough that people are hearing about it, even if they're not receiving a capital call, they're, they're hearing about their buddy that just had to, to pay one. Do you, what do you think is going to happen to the, you know, the LP market? That's not the only thing they're hearing. They're also hearing, wow, interest rates are up. You know, oh, there's rent declines. Uh, vacancies are going up. Uh, property isn't depreciating 20% a year. Uh, IRRs are down. You know, there's all kinds of things. There's all kinds of noise, right, that, that potential LPs are going to be hearing. Uh, that's going to give them reason to uh, think very carefully about their investment decisions. And, you know, now they can also put money into treasuries at almost 5%. So uh, it's, it's going to, I think it's going to make raising capital more difficult. You know, when I was raising capital in what, 2011 for multifamily stuff, you know, people would tell me, I'd go to these meetings and people would be like, I'm not even going to get out of bed unless it's over 20% IRR, you know? And you know we were people were happy with a twelve or thirteen two years ago. Yeah, uh, it's going to swing back to where people may be looking for higher returns, and guess what? They're not there. So you know, bad news makes it difficult to raise capital. You know, it's 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 like uh, well, it's even worse when I was raising money in oh nine and two thousand ten, because at that point, uh, you know, people were like, oh, I can't invest in any real estate. Real estate is toxic. It's catching a falling knife. Uh, you know, there's nothing but bad news. And, you know, it was it was extraordinarily difficult to raise money. It's been very easy to raise money for the last six or seven or eight years. And the pendulum is going to swing back the other way. And as always, whenever the pendulum swings, it always swings a little too far in each direction before it starts to come back. And the, the same will happen here. So do you think that the just the syndication market in general is going to shrink? Um, you know, I, I don't know, but I would be surprised if it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Uh, next question is, so, okay. I, you probably read some of this stuff, but I mean, there's, uh, you know, so there's been in the news, the news recently talking about certain, you know, uh, operators who've gotten in trouble, particularly ones who have like grown really fast, uh, and they are now feeling the pain of like bad debt structures and stuff. Uh, and all, you know, the articles always end with, yeah, but we expect interest rates to come down towards the end of the year and we'll be just fine. So Fed pivot, what do you think happening or not? No, I don't think so. There was just some more hawkish language just a, what, a week or so ago. Mm -hmm. uh, there's even talk now of going back up to a 50 basis point hike at the next meeting, even though 25 was what was priced in. Uh you know, there, there's been a lot of talk about a reversal, but before you reverse the direction of interest rate movement, you first have to stop the movement. Mm. 
you know, a ship doesn't go from forward to reverse in an instant. It slows down, it sits there for a second, reverse thrust, and then it takes a little bit of time to move. This is the same thing here. You, you got to first stop hiking before you stop start lowering. And, and generally, uh, that switch does not flip from one direction to the other. It sits in the middle for a bit. Yeah, and I think that, you know, as long as the economy continues to be as hot as it is, you can't see them stopping anytime soon right i mean well every every time another jobs report comes out it's surprisingly too high right and yeah. it, it must be frustrating the crap out of the fed because they can think like we've we hiked rates four percent in you know, eight months why isn't that fixing it well the reason it's not fixing it is because interest rates aren't the problem <laughs> the problem is they created too much money supply if you look at an m m2 chart or m1 chart from fred and you look at the money, U.S. money supply, I was shocked by this stat that 80% of all U.S. dollars that are currently in existence were created over like the last three years. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. And then they wonder like, why is there inflation? Oh, gee, I wonder. Uh, so let's just raise interest rates. That'll fix it. It's like, no, stop spending. That'll fix it. It does. But, you know, if there's that much money in the out there in the system and interest rates aren't the problem, I mean, does that not? argue in favor of just going out and buying real estate? I mean, you know, or, or do you? Uh, it, it, <laughs> it does, but not yet. I mean, it, right. you know, it's, if they keep, if they keep messing with the interest rates and they keep raising the interest rates, it makes buying the real estate more difficult because you it's so difficult to quantify what the future is going to bring. And, you know, the other thing too, you know, we talk about real estate as a hedge against inflation. So it's like, oh, if there's going to be all this inflation, you should buy real estate. The problem that I see with that argument in this particular case, and I'll, I'll admit, I've made this argument before as well. And, and, I, and I don't believe, uh, I do believe that it's, a, it's an accurate statement to say that real estate is a hedge against inflation. But what happened in this particular case is real estate led the inflation. Mm. So we we had massive rent growth the moment that COVID hit, because all of a sudden the government said, you don't, you don't have to pay your rent. Nobody can evict you. You don't have to pay. So people all over the place just stopped paying rent, started stacking on money and buying big screen TVs and whatever. Um, and they didn't have to move. So therefore, all these apartments are occupied even though no one's paying. So now there's in, in, intense competition for the units that are available because so many units are being occupied by people who aren't paying. And it just threw the supply demand uh, equation totally out of balance and rents absolutely skyrocketed right after COVID. And I mean, look at Phoenix it was up like 46% in two years. And so you had this massive rent growth. There wasn't really any inflation yet, but there was all this massive rent growth. Then all of a sudden, everything else started going up. And that's when it was like, oh, hey, look, inflation. Well, it's just temporary. It's going to go away. Well, it didn't. And it's still here. But the real estate inflation, you know, the rent growth happened so quickly and went yeah. so far that now there could be 10% inflation for the next two years. And rents are already there. So they're not yeah. going to go up another 20%. Uh, they've reached the ceiling. There's too much competition now for those residents' uh, unallocated dollars. They can't afford to have their rent hiked another 10% when price of bacon's at eight bucks or 13 bucks or whatever it's at now. Yeah. And I, I wanted to ask you, like, you know, given that rent, there was so much rent growth in the last couple of years, right? And you could argue in, in some sense that like all, the, like a lot of future rent growth was pulled forward into a short period of time, right? So, yeah. do, you know, that, almost says to me like and i mean you think you're starting to see it in some places that actually rents could go down because you know they just went up too far too fast and now that the intense competition is over uh well you know there's there's nowhere for them to go except the, the wrong direction right and like you said before it may not be in top line you know asking rents but it's going to come through in you know big concessions and things like that it's already happening uh, there's already been month over month rent declines in a lot of metros for about the last three to four months. Phoenix, about the last four or five months, they've, they've had month over month rent declines. Uh, so we, you're already starting to see that happen.
So I do want to leave some time for questions from folks. Um, so if you have a question, uh, once you raise your hand, I'll actually let you ask the question directly rather than put it in the chat. But before I do that, uh, Chris, you can actually like, uh, there's a little hand raised button thing that you can press. But um, the uh, before I do that, I just want to let everybody know that, um, so as you probably know, I'm hosting a conference April 26th to 28th next month in Las Vegas. Brian has kindly agreed to come and he's going to talk about where you should be investing in 2023, the, the best markets now, such as they are. I, I'm not going to let him talk about that now because you got to go to the conference if you want to hear this, but there's a link in uh, the uh, in the chat for the conference. And if you want to go, I'm going to give you a 50% off discount right now if you want to sign up today for that. So I'm going to put that into the box here. There's a discount code uh, right here if you want to come. Um, and so please uh, come and hear Brian. And actually, if you upgrade to the VIP, um, you might actually get to chat with Brian at dinner or something like that. So I'm pimping you out, Brian, uh, so that everybody comes to the conference. But um, I, I would like to open this to questions. So I know that Chris, you have one, and then I'll get to uh, the other Brian. There's a bunch of questions here. So Chris, first, uh, let me unmute you. And why don't you ask Brian your question? So Sure. Brian, thanks for the time. And I appreciate it. For those who don't know, Brian has always been gracious with this time. I've chatted with him multiple times at Bigger Pockets over the many years. So thanks for taking another hour of your life here to help all of us investors. Um, hey, so with all of the, I would say, bad news going on today, how do you keep investors today happy and have deal flow? Because, you know, investors get bored. You want to have more deals for investors. So I guess my question is, what are you pitching investors today so that they don't just stagnate and go, well, Brian's not doing any deals right now. So I guess we'll find something else. Yeah, that that is a great question. And I uh, I wish I had a better answer because what I've been telling investors is now is not the time. Put your money in cash, go, you know, put in a CD, do whatever, uh, it just just wait this out. We'll have something for you eventually. Uh, we we did actually, uh, you know, I, I look at them. I've always said that this business is kind of like a meandering stream through a meadow, right? It always curves. And if you're rowing your boat, you have to be able to row and navigate the directional movements of that stream. Because if you row in a straight line, you run into the ground. Right. Hmm. So I've always operated my business that way, where we try to find what strategies are working today and employ those strategies. Uh, the one I like right now is we're buying real estate debt. And so we launched a debt fund, you know, several months ago and we're buying real estate debt. And, and what this means is I get a day one income stream and I have somebody else's equity in first loss position. And if I'm most concerned about, you know, maybe valuation declines and that sort of stuff, I want somebody else to lose their money before my investors lose theirs. Uh, and so uh, we get to own the real estate without owning the real estate. We get the income stream without, uh, without the same amount of risk. So that's what we're pitching to investors right now is, uh, is buying real estate debt. What, what kind of, uh, what kind of assets is that, Brian? It's a mix. Uh, a lot of the debt is fix and flip single family uh, housing. And uh, that's probably two thirds of our book right now. And the other third of our book is uh, multifamily uh, fix and flip style uh, bridge debt. So, mm -hmm. you know, more heavy rehab tend to be smaller uh, apartment complex uh, type stuff where somebody's coming in and doing a renovation and expecting to uh, reposition the property in one to two years. And is, it, you're not issuing debt though, right? You're only buying debt. Right. right. We, I, I was issuing debt. We, five years ago, I started up a, a, a bridge lending company and we made loans to uh, real estate investors, both in the fix and flip space and in the uh, multifam small multifamily space. And uh, we built a great company. Uh, we actually funded and originated $2 billion in loans in five years, 1 billion of that in the last year that we owned it and we sold the company. So now what I'm doing is I'm actually buying debt from my old company, from the new buyers or they, they still are running this company and they're still originating debt and still selling debt. Uh, and now I'm on the other side of the table. 
And are you buying it at a discount or are you just buying it at par? No, we're buying it at par. A discount isn't necessary when, especially you know, right now rates are, you know, we're buying loans at 10 and a half percent. And so uh, that, that produces a really good return to investors, especially if we can warehouse uh, our book, you know, it kind of in the seven or 8% range, we get a nice spread there too. So uh, we're able to do uh, some pretty interesting returns for investors without uh, having to buy at a discount and without taking on real estate ownership risk. That's great. That sounds really good. All right. Let me uh, get another question here. So of the other Brian on the call, would you um, unmute yourself and ask a yeah. question? Thanks so much, Brian and, and Jonathan, for hosting this. Uh, super informative, super helpful. Um, so my question is a little selfishly just in, in my situation. I'm just trying to understand um, just quickly. My background is kind of similar in the sense that I run a smaller shop. I'm only at a million right now. Um, and I sold my entire portfolio back in 2022. I just kept a rental, my first rental, whatever. Um, it's nostalgic to me. But the question is, you know, when I think about the macro landscape, um, you know, the, what I'm looking at is, you know, there's a hawkish stance, like you mentioned, from interest rate perspective. And I feel similar to what you explained earlier, that um, on the multifamily side, or really just in commercial assets in general, that people are going to get squeezed out of their positions um, who have bridge and maybe even floating debt because of the reasons you mentioned prior. So I guess I'm just curious, you know, with someone like myself who only has a silver bullet, right? Because, you know, I only have one real bullet to kind of do something that makes sense. Um, I try to look for the higher yield home run type of deals because, again, I'm smaller. Um, what would your strategy be if you were in my situation? And a little bit more context there. So right now, I put like a quarter into investing into operators who do single family flips. I'm taking our equity position stakes in their sort of deals and the other sort of 750 kind of just sits for, you know, the next opportunity. But similar to you, I just I don't see those opportunities just yet. So I'm just curious with your 30 years of experience, like what do you feel makes the most sense from an operational perspective for someone as, you know, my size? Yeah, so there's uh, uh, it depends on which way you want to take it, right? If you want to be, you know, the sole owner, you want to be 100% of the whole thing, uh, you know, you're limited by the dry powder that you have available. And you, now you, you're going to have to pick strategies that are going to fit within the sizing uh, that you're constrained to. If, if you want to kind of be the, you know, the head of the snake, so to speak, and you've got all, all the rest of it following right behind you, you could bring in other people uh, with their capital and invest together and do larger projects. I wouldn't do it yet, I think, but if you wait until next year or somewhere around in there, you may find better opportunities. But uh, I mean, right now, I just don't see a lot of reason to move quickly, um, especially when you're talking about the asset base that you're dealing with, you you, you don't want to start taking losses, right? Because you, you want to contain your risk first. I think that's really important right now because there's a lot of risk and a lot of unknowns out there that I would rather wait for a little bit more certainty than, than stretch too far out on the risk curve. So I would stick to higher quality assets uh, and I would wait until you see the right opportunity and not feel like you need to make a move uh, just to make a move. Uh, it's sometimes it's better to like work on your golf game than to work on real estate investing. And I feel like now is one of those times. So okay. uh, I just told somebody earlier today, in fact, that one thing I found has worked for me is I, it's always a bet. It's always better to be a week late than a day early. And I've been both and I've done far better when I'm a week late than when I'm a day early. Cause you get in too soon and something moves against you, it can crush you. Yep. Uh, but if you let that trend starts to start to build and then you just layer yourself in when there's momentum, you can do extraordinarily well. So I think just uh, take your time. Uh, you know, put your capital into something that's earning you some kind of return with low amount of risk, whether that's debt, whether it's um, uh, treasury bonds, uh, you know, just some somewhere where you can find a, a decent amount of 
return for a low amount of risk. That's where I would want to be right now. Okay. That's thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, Robert, you're next. You've had your hand up for a while. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you both for this information. It's 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 very timely. And it feels like a mastermind. There's only seven of us here. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. Um, I had a question, but I threw it in the trash can as soon as I heard about the debt. Uh, what is a really accessible resource to get into that asset class for a sophisticated investor, you know, as opposed to an accredited is what I'm talking about. Please. Just yes. So there's a, there's a couple of ways. One is there's, uh, there's private money loan brokers out there that broker private money loans to individual real estate investors using the money that they get from uh, investors that bring money uh, to them to loan. So in other words, you're in those cases, you'd actually be the funding source to make a single loan on a single property. You're the beneficiary of the deed of trust or the mortgagee on the mortgage, uh, and you're a direct lender. Now, uh, you can find opportunities like that locally where you can actually go drive by the property. You could get to know the borrower uh, for like fix and flip type opportunities. So you might want to look into that. That's that's one avenue. Uh, I think the disadvantage to that approach is uh, that uh, uh, you're making one loan on one property. You don't have any diversification. Right. There's you, you haven't eliminated any single points of failure. And, and so that's the flip side of it. There there are uh, mortgage REITs out there you could invest in that are publicly traded mortgage REITs. Uh, that's another alternative. And I think, you know, there's probably debt funds that are out there that uh, don't have a accredited investor limitation. If they're not using the 506C exemption, there, there may be some that are 506B eligible. And uh, you could look for those and invest in those kinds of funds where you do get some of that diversification. And that's why I, I like the real estate debt is, you know, if you're making, if you're investing in a debt fund where they've got 50 loans, you know, you don't have any single point of failure other than the debt fund itself. Awesome. Thanks for that. Uh, okay, Eddie, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, Brian. Thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. Um, I have one uh, observation and then a question. And my observation is going by your history and what, what you told us today, it's like every single time you went out of your lane, something bad happened. You are so right. That's a very, that's a very good observation. I've actually said right? that in the past too. Yes, agreed. Yeah. So the lesson I take from that is stay in your lane, whatever that is. A hundred percent. Stay in your lane. hundred okay. percent. Yes, so, yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, try to, I try to learn from other people's mistakes and not learn from my own. So that's very valuable for me. Uh, so that's one. Then the question. Um, yes, I've heard everything you said. And I appreciate everything you said regarding how you're managing your business. Regarding, you know, it, maybe this isn't the right time and all the rest. And so you're like looking for more ways to utilize your capital, et cetera. But uh, a twofer. One, what would you say for someone like me who has already set himself the goal this year of uh, getting a hundred units under management, you know, starting the in, the, in this case, you know, essentially, and just, you know, want to get my hands dirty, despite all the, you know, craziness that's going on in the market. If I do come across a good deal, it might not necessarily be one 100 unit uh, property, but maybe like eight here, 10 there, 12 there, but my, my stated goal this year is to get like a hundred units under management. So is that still a viable, uh, thing in this time and generation, or what do you say? Well, I, I think that uh, it's it's a challenging goal. It, it might be an easy goal to meet if you can find a deal flow because there's not as many buyers, so you'll have less competition. Uh, but you also have a lot more uncertainty, right? Your financing structure is going to be more uncertain. Uh, what the future is going to hold is going to be more uncertain. Uh, if you're buying for your own account, and this is your own goal, and it's your personal money, and this is your retirement plan, and you're not retiring for a few decades. You know, real estate is one of those things like if you wait long enough, it will always 
uh, give you the result you're looking for if you wait long enough and if you can. So, you know, right now, uh, the part of the problem that trips people up is they can't wait all, as long as it takes because their loan comes due or, you know, they have negative cash flow and they can't service it and that sort of stuff. If you have, if you can get positive cash flow and you're not chasing, you know, trying to get high returns, uh, and you aren't financing with short-term money and you can find the deal flow and you have the time horizon to be able to wait long enough for that to produce the result for you, absolutely go for it. And I would just say that one thing I learned early on the hard way is it's much easier to lose a million dollars than it is to make a million dollars. So if you treat these real estate investments like a loaded weapon, which is an object that can either save your life or kill you, if you treat it that way, uh, it could save your life. Uh, So invest smartly, carefully, look for the best deals and finance it right. Don't over leverage and wait it out and you'll be fine. And if you don't accomplish your goal, let's say you get 20 units, don't beat yourself up about it and don't feel like a failure. Instead, buy the other 80 units next year and you might find that overall your portfolio was better than had you bought all 100 this year. So let let nature take its course. Okay, that makes sense. And I've always been the, of the opinion of, you know, shoot for the moon, uh, shoot for the stars, you might hit the moon and, and the way as you go. Absolutely. And, and, and everything happens for a reason. So, it, you know, let, let it play out and don't force it. Okay, cool. So that, great. That's, that was great advice, Brian. And I, I, uh, I'm sorry, Eddie, I don't know if you had a follow-up. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but, um, no, go on. you know, sort of years ago, I, I have a very smart friend who manages like several billions of dollars on Wall Street and, uh, he remember once years and years and years ago talking, he basically was of the opinion that if you have a five-year window for real estate, you should be okay. Kind of whatever you're, like, wherever you go into, like wh- wh- whatever point in the cycle you're buying, if you have five years, you can kind of like wait out whatever comes your way. Do you, do you agree with that? That's like a long enough period of time, generally speaking, to to wind up all right, like all the, everything else being equal, you're not over leveraged and you don't run out of cash. And yeah, I would say more often than not. Yes. Uh, more often than not. Yes. I, I mean, there's exceptions to that rule. If you bought an 05 in California, it took you a full 10 years to get back to zero. Right. You know, so it just, it, there are exceptions to that rule. Uh, but I, I think that's, that's a good rule. And, and it also, you know, a lot of this depends on what you're doing. You know, if you're raising money from other investors and you're promising to deliver a return, you're in a different position than someone that's investing their own personal capital. Uh, you know, it, it really depends because, uh, you know, a lot of what I do is done with capital that belongs to other people. And I have to, res- I have to perform for them and I'm responsible for delivering a result uh, that's difficult to deliver today in if I were to buy something right now. And there's a lot of people that raised money from other investors two or three years ago uh, that are going to find that everything they promised their investors is going to get blown up in their face because they financed it improperly and got over leveraged and too short term and maturities and, and, and so on. So it, it all just depends on how you structure it, what capital you're using and what your goals are and what your time horizon is. So I know we're kind of at at five o'clock already, and I promised Brian we'd be out for an hour. Do you have do you have a couple more minutes, Brian? Are you right, or you got to you got for ride? you, Jonathan? Absolutely, and you uh, got this great audience. I don't want to leave them short. I will I will answer every last question until you run out of time. All right, I appreciate that. I I will have to run because I have a parent teacher conference to go to, but I do have a few more minutes. So I don't, Eddie. Did you um were you finished with your questions, or did you have another one? Just a quick follow up. Okay. Um. Keeping your team as small as possible has been a goal of mine. Is that a realistic goal in the multifamily space? 
Yeah, I've bought eight hundred million dollars in real estate with like a small handful of people. Uh, I, I I heavily believe in keeping your team right sized. What you don't want to do is create an enormous mouth to feed uh, that you feel compelled to make hasty decisions uh, simply to earn some kind of fee so that you can cover your overhead. Stay lean and mean, and you'll be able to survive when things aren't going your way. Gotcha. Very good. Thanks, Very good. Thanks thought. so much. You're welcome. Awesome. So Chris, is that, uh, is that your hand raised on a new question or you just didn't? Okay. All right. So got to unmute yourself. Yeah. All right. I have a new question. Let's see. Lower hand. Um, so with the, how do I take out these reactions anyway? Um, so I feel like with the way that the economy has the rich keep kind of getting richer, the poor might have getting poorer, the middle class kind of disappearing a little bit. Um, my question is really on section eight. And if you have any experience with section eight, to me, it seems like a really viable investment of time and energy right now with some guaranteed government funding of rents on a monthly basis. But I know section eight has a pretty rough stigma. And I'm curious if you've ever dealt with it, if you think that that's a great idea, a terrible idea. Um, I'm like diving into it, learning it, but have not bought anything with it. So I would love any feedback if you have any. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, I've, I, I think it depends on, on what your asset is. So I had a single family home that I, I rented to a section eight tenant and she lived there for like 15 years Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, I was paid on time every single month, never missed a dollar and it worked out great. I mean, it was, it was no hassle, no fuss, no muss. Uh, so on, on that scale, it can be, a, it could be a great thing. I've also had section eight at apartment complexes and it's been more difficult to manage, uh, you know, because you get a high concentration uh, of, of those folks and, sometimes it can develop to be problematic. Uh, not always, you know, some of these people are great people, 100% great people, but some of them are like, let's form a tenants union and, you know, <laughs> let's, let's get together and, you know, screw the man, you know, and it's like, well, that, that makes it challenging as a, as an owner. Uh, so it's a mixed bag. Uh, I found it interesting that, uh, we were getting a loan on a property that we were buying that had a concentration of Section 8 residents. And the lender uh, was concerned by this concentration. And it actually made getting the loan a little bit more challenging. And we had to uh, promise the lender that we were going to reduce the concentration uh in order to uh satisfy the lender so uh you know it's it's a it's a weird world we live in I mean, it's a great program and yet uh it can be challenging so it's a okay. mixed bag thanks i appreciate the feedback and uh brian unmute yourself please yes oh thanks again for for taking the extra time mine is a really quick question again just context being um i'm a younger individual so i haven't had the experience of you know participating in different cycles um as a participant i should say as a participant with resources um and so i'm just curious you know when i look at deals i've been you know i think spoiled just to have good deals back in 2021 2020 um so when i'm waiting for deals especially on the multifamily side what is the expectation so from an underwriting perspective my thought process is a good deal probably looks like, you know, whatever interest rates are. So maybe like a nine, 10 cap, you know, at a one, three, one, three, five DSCR, you know, 75% LTV. Is that sort of what is realistic? Cause I just, I'm not seeing that at all. And I sometimes wonder if I'm being too optimistic. Um, so I'm just curious, like, you know, in your experience, what, what, what does a good deal look like coming out of this sort of down downturn? One of my best deals was probably like a 0 0.5 cap, <laughs> like not a five cap, a 0 0.5 cap was Whoa. probably one of my best deals. Okay. Um, cap rate will will not serve you. So if you're if you're trying to uh, 
come up with like quick deal metrics by saying like, oh, well, if it's this cap rate, it's good. Uh, if it's that cap rate, it's bad. Uh, is going to leave a lot of, uh, you're going to leave a lot of meat on the bone. Mm. Uh, you're, you're, there's deals going to slide right through your fingers. So what you've really got to look at is IRR. What's the internal rate of return? And, and, and that's so much more difficult than cap rate because cap rate is a very simple calculation, right? You take the price, you take the net operating income, you divide by that, and there you get a cap rate. And you go like, oh, it's an eight cap, great deal. Well, if it's an eight cap in a, uh, that needs like you know millions of dollars worth of work just to even make it habitable, or it's in a declining uh, rent declining market where rents are going down, uh, you know that might be why it's an eight cap. Uh, if you've got high, extremely high turnover, I mean, there's so many things that can make an eight cap or a ten cap deal be a total loser. Mm. Uh, so you've got to look at things like rent growth, which is difficult to quantify right? You got to look at the exit price, which is a function of exit cap rate, which is difficult to quantify. You've got to look at cash flow, which is a function of borrowing cost, which right now is difficult to quantify. And you can see why I'm having trouble uh, because I can't just use cap rate. It's got to be the whole totality of that financial performance because you can have a property that's like a, a one cap, but rents are at 50% of market uh, rent growth is running away in that area uh, and that sort of thing. And you could come in there and, you know, increase rents, make a couple easy renovations and management changes, and you could kill it. Mm -hmm. And you could end up with a 10% stabilized yield on cost, wow. which think of that as cap rate after you buy stabilized mm -hmm. yield on cost. That's your number, right? And so where you make money in real estate is the delta between stabilized yield on cost and prevailing cap rates. If everything in the market is selling at a five cap and you can take a property where you can get uh, and let's call it a seven and a half percent yield on cost, meaning if you take the NOI after you've done all of this, and you divide that by all the money you put into it, the purchase price, closing costs, um, the uh, renovation dollars, all of that, all that goes into, instead of purchase price, you use all that all summed together. That gives you what's called stabilized yield on cost. And if your stabilized yield on cost is seven and a half and cap rates are a five, you've made a 50% profit, right? Because a five is two and a half percent difference between a five cap and a seven and a half percent yield on cost. You just boost, you got a 50% gain just like that. And it had nothing to do with cap rate. So good deal means what's your entry price? What can you do to grow rents? What can you do to grow income? What can you do to cut expenses? Uh, that's where the money is made in real estate. It's not by uh, going in cap rate. Fair enough. I appreciate that. Yes, sir. All right. So, um, just going to ask for final questions and give you one last reminder that if you want to actually uh, meet Brian in person, he will be speaking at our event, the 26th through 28th in Las Vegas. The link is in the Q and a, the discount code for 50% off your ticket is in the, dis is in the link as well. Sorry, in the, the chat as well. So please come show up, hang out with us, uh, pick Brian's brain and uh, watch him drink vanilla Coke and uh <laughs> stuff like that so uh i think maybe we could just sort of one last question if anybody you know who just came on to the call has a question perhaps um now's your chance and uh otherwise we will i'm looking uh, forward to vegas jonathan it's gonna be pretty cool we're gonna be at the link hotel right yep and it's good. i'm gonna be uh i'm gonna be staying a couple doors down so i'll be able to walk over there and spend some time with you guys and it's, it's going to be, it's going to be a good time. So uh, I'm actually flying down there on my way to uh, stagecoach festival, a big country music uh, festival in Indio, California that mm -hmm. uh, takes place starting the day after this conference. So uh, it's kind of cool. I'm, uh, I'm making a stop on the way to come visit with y'all. Yeah. I really appreciate you. And I'm really looking forward to, uh, to your talk and it's always fun hanging out with you and talking shop and also talking about other stuff unrelated to real estate too. It's probably, probably more fun. <laughs> but yeah. That's, a, that's, you know, I got, I got limited stuff to share as I get outside of the real estate world. <laughs> uh, any last questions before Brian goes, Chris, do you have your, is that your hand up again? You're like, you're insatiable. Okay. All right. One last question from Chris. Unmute yourself. 
I mean, if no one else would jump in, I mean, it's not every day you get to have these calls, John. Somebody's really got to serve the duty, right? So thanks for being yeah. that guy. I mean, if, if, hey, I saw another question came up, so I don't want to bogart all, all right, these let's, questions. Let's, let's, let's I'll, ask I'll, yeah, I'll sit back. And if there's more time, I have, I have like one more question I would ask, and then we can, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll let me, let me ask, thanks. let me ask uh, Niha. I think that's how you pronounce the name. Niha. Um, yeah. Hey there. Hey, how are you? What's your question? So I'm a newbie and I'm just trying to learn and get into the multifamily area. And my question to you is very basic. Since I don't have a whole lot of contacts and I'm just starting out, what would be your recommendation to source deals initially? So one thing I, I like to do, like if, I remember when I was kind of first trying to branch out into new markets and, and, uh, and that sort of stuff is uh, the first place I would go was LoopNet. And I, I would go there because not because I thought I was going to find a deal because that's, you know, the old saying is, you know, all bad deals go to die on LoopNet. And that's probably not far from the truth. But what I would do is I would look to find property for sale in the area I was interested in on LoopNet. And I would look to see who the brokers were. And then I would contact those brokers and I would say like, you know, hey, I, I saw your listing on LoopNet. That was not a fit for me, but I do want to buy in your area. And if, you know, if you, if you have anything else, that I can look at, or if anything else comes up, you know, and start to build some dialogue uh, with those brokers because the brokers are the gatekeepers. I don't care what anybody says. Everybody's, oh, you don't need brokers, you know. No, in multifamily, brokers are the gatekeepers. That's where the deals are. It's it's much more difficult, not impossible. There's people that have been successful at it, but it's much more difficult to source deals directly from sellers in the multifamily space. Uh, brokers, on the other hand, have access to all of that. I can tell you as a multifamily owner, I get calls constantly from brokers asking like, oh, hey, about this asset that you own, when are you planning to sell? Or, you know, you want to sell it, I can bring a buyer, blah, blah, blah. And I'll say something like, look, I'm not going to sell that thing for like two more years. You know, we just bought it. We just refi it, whatever the case may be. Well, you know what he's doing? He's going back into his CRM and he's putting, he might sell in two years, <laughs> right? So all the brokers know all of this stuff. And yeah. so when you, when you talk to them, they're going to know, like, you know, I know a guy that might be selling in a couple of years. I'll call him up, you know, so you got to start somewhere and it's a relationship business. So start by building relationships with the gatekeepers. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's great advice. And I would just add actually one thing about LoopNet, Brian, it's probably not something that you really see or, or deal with like these days, but I, I think you're absolutely right about LoopNet and, and Crexy being places where like deals go to die if you're in like a really liquid, hot market, right? Because in the market like that, they're never going to make it to Crexy or, or, or LoopNet. However, if you're in a smaller market, you're often dealing with brokers who don't know what else to do with the property that they've been like asked by their buddy to market, right? Or if they're like the, there's some markets, they don't even really have commercial brokers. So they just go and stick it on LoopNet because they just don't know what else to do. That's their marketing. So you may actually find some decent deals in smaller markets uh, from smaller brokers who that's the only thing they can think to do. So it's Absolutely worth looking at true. Yeah. Absolutely true. But that's uh, that's my question. And so why do we... Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for your question. Yeah. And so, Chris, why don't we make this the last question? Because I do have to run. Um, so ask away and then we'll just wrap up here. I appreciate it. If you, if you have the time. Um, yeah. You mentioned I'm kind of in that space now, Brian, where I'm building my team out, hiring some assistants, trying to take this from the side hustle to the main hustle right? Last year was the first year I made more from real estate than my day job. And so you mentioned having a small team, keeping things really lean. And so this is a question on the business of being a syndicator, the business of being an operator. What do you find is the best and highest use of your time? Like what's the thing that you do that you don't have a team that does, right? Like I'm trying to, for me, this is kind of a, a selfish question, really. I'm trying to figure out what Chris should do versus everyone else on my team should do. Cause I can do everything, you know, I could Photoshop something or type an email, but I a consistent can't be on a zoom call like this, for instance. So I'm curious what the, if you have any feedback on that or, or wisdom that I can take in a two minute segment here. My job is to say no. Okay. Uh, that, that's, that's my job. If you ask anybody on my team, they'll be like, what does Brian do? He, 
he says no to everything I bring to him. I bring him a deal I think we're going to like, and he says no to it. Uh, you know, my, be the decision maker, right? Your your job is to say like, that's a deal we're going to do, or that's a deal we're not going to do. Uh, that's somebody's going to be ultimately responsible for the performance of this business, and that someone is going to be you. Uh, therefore, you should be taking uh, that role of being the final decision maker, and you've got to be the filter, the grim reaper, the uh, the the uh, the mitigator of risk. Uh, you know that is that is that is your role. Uh, you're you're the guy. You're the one that's everybody's going to point to. If things go wrong, they're going to be calling you. Uh, how do you want that conversation to go? You know, well, you know, I told them we maybe shouldn't have done that deal, and they did it anyway. You know, that's not it. It's got to be like, you know, say no when you got to say no. That's your job. And outside of that, you're going to find yourself doing a few other things. Like you're going to be point person on obtaining financing. Uh, you're, uh, so, so this is my role here. Here's what I do, right? I'm, uh, I'm responsible for all legal. So when we're, when we, uh, find a deal we're going to do, I'm going to do the final contract negotiation. I'm going to be involved with legal on developing the purchase and sale agreement. I'm going to be involved with legal on formation of entities and operating agreements and deal structure. I'm going to make those decisions on deal structure uh, I'm going to be interfacing with the lenders uh, and ensuring that we get the debt. And I'm going to be monitoring our uh, capital raise with my investor relations team to make sure that you know we're getting the amount of uh, investor leads that we need to get that deal closed. That's really my role. I'm I'm not out on airplanes all day looking at real estate. Uh, you know, I'm not. Uh, in the weeds on operational decisions. I, I don't, I don't like, I'm not on the phone with the site managers. I've got people to do all of those things. Uh, my role is to mitigate risk, get deals closed, make sure that the legal is tight uh, and, uh, and capital formation. Awesome. Well, Brian, I appreciate thanks so much. it. Thank you yeah. for laying that out. Sure thing. Sorry, Jonathan. That's okay. No, I was just going to thank Brian. So Brian, thank you. Especially thank you for staying a little bit late and answering everybody's questions. Very generous as always. Uh, it's one of the, the great things I admire about you. Many things I admire about you, but I admire your generosity very much as well. And uh, thanks again. And once again, everybody come out to the conference and meet Brian in person and uh, hang out with us. And um, I look forward to seeing everybody there. So thanks. Thanks to Brian. Thanks to all of you for being here today. I'll see you all soon. Thank you guys.